love it. I love the family of God. Um, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, so a couple of things um, as kind of a recap, I guess you could say, because um, we're in like week 40 or something of the Great Sustainer. Uh, so obviously we can't recap everything. Um, and so I, I don't want to spend a ton of time. The recap elements will kind of be woven into the message. Um, I really feel like the Lord laid a specific word on my heart. Um, I shared a little bit of this with some of our young adults and a little bit of something else with our recovery ministry. By the way, let's hear it for our recovery ministry. Come on, people. It's amazing. Um, ever since I did that, though, every time Pastor Jason begins to talk about trials and tribulations, these words surface in my heart. Um, and the words are patience, pressure, and presence. We are sustained through patience, pressure, and presence. Um, and it's one of these things where if we can see it rightly, we have an opportunity to give God costly worship. A couple of months ago in our night of prayer meeting, um, this was something that the Lord was already doing in our staff through a staff prayer meeting that we have every Monday morning. Um, but we were looking at Bethany, um, a place where Jesus frequented because he had friends there. Um, and one of the literal meanings of Bethany is the house of affliction. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus chose to frequent a place that means the house of affliction. Why? Because he had friends there, because he was honored there, and because costly worship took place there. And I think one of the things that we, as, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, have the opportunity to do in the middle of trials, in the middle of difficulty, in the middle of sorrow, in the middle of it, we have the opportunity to welcome Jesus in and give him a resting place for his presence right in the middle of the affliction. Because a lot of us, we can relate to the affliction, right? A lot of us can relate to that. How amazing would it be if there is a group of people who can actually relate more to the costly worship that takes place in the middle of affliction? And I want us to be that, that type of people. And we have the opportunity to, amen? Um, now, when it comes to oh, honoring the Lord in the middle of it, um, a lot of times we don't recognize him. I think Pastor Jason's done a great job explaining this every which way with different examples, stories, verses. But the reality is sometimes we don't see the Lord when, when we're in the storm, when we're in the middle of it. You know, we just got done singing, you know, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, but we left one out. It's Jehovah Sneaky. <laughs> because sometimes... He sneaks right into the middle of the affliction. And then he's looking for a people who will honor him in it, who will give him costly worship in it. He's saying, here I am, I'm right in the middle of it. Will you look unto me? Will you get your eyes off of the storm and fix your eyes on me? Because I am the author and the perfecter of your faith. We have that opportunity. Jehovah Sneaky. He's gonna sneak right into the middle of the pain, into the middle of the trial. And you have the opportunity as the people of God to say, I don't know how this is gonna work it out. Oh man, this is, this is painful, this is confusing. Uh, me, 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 I, can you notice whenever we're in the middle of it, it's very, very me-centric. But we have the opportunity to look unto Jesus. Afflictions, trials, and tribulations, pressure, is the opportunity to acknowledge him. In all our ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Lean not on your own understanding. Amen? This was not in my notes. I, I just feel like that was on my heart. So listen, if you're wondering, if you're wondering, you know, we've been talking about great sustainer. If you're wondering why you don't feel very sustained, like you've, you've heard almost 40 weeks 
of how he is our sustainer. And maybe you're in this place of, man, I still don't really feel very sustained. Then listen, I urge you, stop trying to make Jesus simply part of your life and realize that you are hidden in Christ and he is your life. In Acts 17, 28, the first part says this, for in him we live and move and have our being. We learned about you know, the, the, the layers of the court, right? Outer court, inner court, holy of holies. And now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We must stop trying to make the holy of holies exclusive to church attendance and behavior and stop trying to hang the veil back up after God paid such a high price to rip it down. Jesus is not an accessory to your life. Jesus is not part of your life. He must be all. He is your life. And you must cling to him. You must hold fast to him. This theme is so important to me. So much so that, um, spoiler alert, if you didn't finish my book yet, I ended my whole book on a whole section called Hold Fast. Because there's something significant of realizing that we can take hold of something and realize that we are being held by someone. So this, this word, hold fast, um, you know, the, how we come to understand it now, the origins are from the Dutch, houd vast, which means to hold tightly. The phrase hold fast referred to holding tightly to a ship's rigging and ropes. So throughout maritime history, sailors would get those letters tattooed on their knuckles. Have you seen this? Right? Hold fast. Now, Pastor Jason keeps saying, you know, I'm not going to get a tattoo, but if I ever did, it's going to be that. What if he comes back with some knuck tattoos? You know what I'm saying? Like, hold fast. Gangster, I know you're from Memphis, but man, (laughs) hold fast. But it served as a reminder. It served as a reminder that they can weather any storm as long as they don't let go. I'm gonna look at a couple of scriptures here. I'm gonna go fast. Um, I might not even read them word for word, so Lord, just follow me. Um, but these are references of hold fast that stand out to me. Deuteronomy 10, 20 starts with us fearing, serving, and holding fast to the Lord. Proverbs 4, 4 says that our hearts would hold fast to his words. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, we should examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. Hebrews 3, 6 says, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Hebrews 3, 14 says, for if we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Revelation 2, 25, (laughs) he says, but hold fast what you have till I come. He's coming, amen. (laughs) Revelation 3.11, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. We must hold fast to his righteousness, not your own. We must hold fast to the finished work of Jesus, not your best efforts. You must hold fast to Christ himself. A little over a month ago when I was up here sharing, I talked about how we are being sustained by our great high priest, Jesus, and the magnitude of that and the power of that and what that means. We've been seeing the obvious theme throughout what we've been learning lately with the meaning of hold fast fresh on our mind. What I wanna do is I'm gonna read the passage that we've looked at um, a bunch of times now about having an anchor for the soul, but I wanna tie in the prior verses that pastor has been teaching about the immutable oath God made with himself that we enter into because of what Christ has done. Now remember, we're talking about how we are sustained through patience, pressure, and presence. Okay, so just keep that on your mind. But what I'm gonna do is, I I pulled the the stool up, I don't know if you noticed, because I'm, I'm about to read a lot, but I want you to stay engaged. Are you with me? 
Like I want you to lean in to God's word. I'm gonna read this in three different translations because I believe each one just kind of hits a point home. Okay, so can we lean in today? Yeah. Hebrews 6, 16 through 20. For men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, that's us, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Wow. Now look at this in New Living Translation. Now, when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Let me stop right there. God has not changed his mind about you. And he won't. He won't. He is not a man that he should lie. Amen? Hmm. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for the souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Amen. I got one more. All right. This is the message paraphrase. This one's just fun. <laughs> when people make promises, they guarantee them by appeal to some authority above them so that if there is any question that they'll make good on the promise, the authority will back them up. When God wanted to guarantee his promises, he gave his word, a rock solid guarantee. God can't break his word. And because his word cannot change, the promise is likewise unchangeable. Amen? Now listen to this. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God where Jesus running on ahead of us has taken up his permanent post as high priest for us in the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. Whew. Last week, Pastor Jason used the example with the rope and how some of us feel like we're barely hanging on. Remember, he said it's almost like you've got like a little hangnail on your pinky and that hangnail happened to snag a fiber of the rope and that's, that defines how you're holding on, right? And some of us related to that or some of us have been there. But I need to remind you today, it is not the strength of your pinky that is giving you hope. It is the strength of his strong and righteous right hand that is upholding you, holding you, and will never let you go. It's not your pinky. It's not your pinky. Amen? And that's the point he was making. You really think that this is what's enabling you to hang in there? No. The vine branches relationship, the vine wraps around the weaker one. Some translations say that he takes away the one that does not bear fruit, but the real translation is he props up the one. He props up the one. It's not your pinky's strength. It's his righteous right hand upholding you, helping you. You really think you can do this in your own strength? On your best day, heck no. And most of us, we don't have a whole lot of best days. 
but every day can be cause for worship and rejoicing unto the Lord. Why? Because the eyes aren't on me. The eyes aren't on my strength. I lift my eyes up to the hills where my help comes from. Where does it come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heavens and earth. He's holding you. He's holding you. Amen. In the life of a Christ follower, strength is always tied to joy. And we see this in Hebrews 12. Jesus was strengthened to endure the horrifying weight of the cross because of joy that was set before him. Hebrews 12 too, look at it. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, and this is something that a lot of people, you know, we don't spend enough time on. When it says the joy that was set before him, what do you think that was? It's you. (laughs) You were the joy that was set before Jesus. And that joy strengthened him to be able to go to the cross, endure the cross, and overcome. So listen carefully. If Jesus had us as his motivation, surely we can have him as ours. Wow, think about this. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured. He was strengthened to overcome because he had you on his mind. And if he was able to do that, then we need to remind ourselves to look unto Jesus and we will be strengthened to overcome. Amen? Amen, 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 amen. We love this verse. It's not on the screen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It's Nehemiah 8.10. And the context of this verse is interesting because the children of Israel are coming out of Babylonian captivity and they are coming out of exile back to Jerusalem. Ezra, the priest and scribe, begins to read the law to the people. The people start wailing, weeping, and mourning as the law is being read to the people. Why? Because they realized that they did not and could not keep the law that was given to them. Therefore, it led them into bondage, captivity, and exile. So when they were finally brought back to Jerusalem, they begin to weep as they realize, wow, we went through all this because of our own sin, because we couldn't measure up. And you know what Ezra said? He said, do not weep. Instead, go eat, drink, and be merry because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Your strength is not found in, oh man, yeah, I can't measure up. I can't do this. No, your strength is found in the strength of the Lord. And then from that place, a joy rises up in you. Why? Because it's so freeing. It's so liberating. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now listen, there is absolutely people in this room that need the strength of the Lord. Absolutely, I'm one of them. And when I look at my tribulation, trial, storm, circumstance, whatever, when I look at that and the details of that, the last thing that comes to my mind is joy. (laughs) But that's the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It goes against your feelings. It is contrary to the ways of the world. And so if you can get your eyes off of your storm and off your circumstance and you look unto Jesus, you can't help but be filled with joy. And when you look unto Jesus and you feel that joy deep down in your soul, you begin to feel the strength of the Lord saying, oh man, I'm an overcomer. Why? Because he overcame already. I can do this. I can make it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I've heard it said this way. (laughs) We don't just need strength after the battle. We need strength in the battle. And it's in the battle that we're not really mindful of being joyful. That's why we have to remember the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. So again, get your eyes up. Get your eyes on him. You'll be filled with strength. You'll be filled with his joy. 
Amen? Remember, patience, pressure, presence. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You hear that? This is the Apostle Paul who's been through some stuff and he said, our light affliction. <laughs> Whoa. So he's not making light of it. He's saying in comparison to the eternal weight of glory, it's light. Verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, remember, we're looking unto Jesus. We do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are, say that word, temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. How many of you want to experience a weight of glory? How many of you want to live glory to glory? We sang it. My future is glory to glory. We get excited about that. We sing it. We say, yes, yes, yes. But you have to first be willing to go from faith to faith because it's faith to faith and then glory to glory. And faith, there's an old saying, faith that cannot be test tested cannot be trusted, right? Faith, when it is built, is able to hold the weight of glory that you were intended to hold. And that comes through pressure. Notice that any time faith is required, it's not an easy situation. Or faith wouldn't be required. It's through pressure. It's through trial, discomfort, difficulty, testing. Isaiah 43, 2, not on the screen, but it says when you walk through the fire, you won't be burnt. A lot of us would just say, hey, Jesus, just beam me up and like make me appear on the other side of the fire. I don't want to go through that. But the promise is when, when you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. You might be feeling like it is completely consuming you right now. But the reality is that God does not waste any trial of fire. And any trial of fire that feels like it might be burning you is actually burning away anything that needs to be burnt away so that things that need to remain will remain on the other side of that fire. And that's why it says it will not burn you. It will not overtake you, the real you, the righteousness of God you. That's the one that endures. Hold fast to hope. Hebrews 11.1 1. Again, I said, if you want to go from glory to glory, be willing to go from faith to faith. So let's just quick reminder what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I want to look at this in the Amplified because it just adds a bunch of adjectives to make sure we understand. <laughs> faith is the assurance, title deed, confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. Now, when you hear faith to faith, that comes from Romans 1, 16 through 17. It says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then this idea of glory to glory, it comes from 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18, which says this. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Remember, weeks and weeks ago, Pastor Jason said, the Lord of the new covenant is the Holy Spirit. We're not living by the letter of the law any longer. We're living under the influence and, and power of the Holy Spirit. But look at 18. We all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Wow. 
being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Look at 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Glory comes through patience. Glory comes through pressure. And you're sustained through his presence. You're sustained through it all. Look at 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after, after, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The whole purpose is that last line right there. To him be the glory. To him be the glory. Pressure and patience have purpose and can be productive if you let it. <laughs> I love how Romans 12, 12 New American Standard Bible says it this way. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. May that be what is said of my life. And I hope that that's your heart too. Oh man, they rejoiced in hope. They persevered in tribulation. They were devoted to prayer. Look at New Living. I love it. This one's fun. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. <laughs> I, guys, listen. At the end of the day, that's it. That's it. That's it. Rejoice in confident hope. Be patient in your trouble. Keep on praying. Why? So that he receives the glory through your life. Look at Romans 5, 1 through 5. It's such a well-known verse, but man, we can't, we can't look at this one enough. Therefore, having been justified by faith, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom... Also, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. <laughs> Something that I'm realizing and learning over and over, often the hard way, we were never promised understanding in anything, but we were promised presence in everything. You are not promised understanding in anything, but you are promised presence in everything. You realize that, right? This isn't, this isn't a feel-good moment right here. God owes you no explanation. 
God owes you nothing. He owes me in the middle of my trial when I'm saying, why God, why? He, know, he owes me no explanation. I'm grateful for those times that he, that he gives something. I'm grateful for that. But he owes me nothing. I must hold fast to something beyond that. His presence. That's what's sustaining me. When I'm having to be patient, his presence. When I'm feeling the pressure, his presence. If you let it, that will set you free. Because some of you have been stuck asking God why. And, and listen, your why is probably very, very valid because you're dealing with heartbreak. But he wants to heal your heart. He wants to be your all. Your one thing, we just sang it. You are my one thing, Lord. That's why the Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the answer. So when you ask the question, be ready for the answer to simply be Jesus. Like when you're listening, Lord, why am I going through this? Why is this happening? I don't understand. Be ready for the answer to be, here I am. Presence. You're sustained by it. We have to have a fresh perspective in our trials. We have to. The patience I'm needing because of a delayed promise, if I have the right perspective, I can say, well, you know what? That promise is gaining interest. <laughs> like I've heard that before. Delayed promises gain interest. So for some of you who have been holding on to hope on the word of the Lord, you know it, he spoke it to you, it was confirmed in scripture, and you've been holding on for years, maybe even decades, and you feel like letting go, then have a fresh perspective today that says, oh man, this must be gaining some interest because when it happens, look what the Lord has done. It wasn't anything I did. And I asked for this years ago. Now look what he did, plus the interest that it gained, the lessons that you learned, the strength that you built, the faith that you now have, right? Fresh perspective on the trial is so important. Think of another one. The pressure I'm feeling because of this bad diagnosis. Listen, there hasn't been a time in our church that I can ever remember that we haven't had this many Sick people or people dealing with serious conditions and I am not okay with it and I am gonna bombard heaven until I see some changes take place in bodies. Now listen, that feeling of pressure because of the diagnosis, we can get our eyes on that because that is obviously what we are feeling in the moment or the fresh perspective says, what an awesome opportunity for me to experience the hand of Jehovah Rapha, my healer. What an awesome opportunity for my life to become a testimony of God's faithfulness and sustainment. Because when we get our eyes off of this, even though this is so Real, it's such our reality. We have to look onto a greater reality, a higher reality. Jesus Christ, him crucified, resurrected, ascended, and enthroned. Are you hearing me? God, there's so many horrible things represented in this room that you're facing. And it breaks the heart of God. But he wants to be made known in it. In the middle of the affliction. Jehovah Sneaky. <laughs> 
What if we saw tribulation, the pressure, and the need for patience as an usher to experience a greater measure of his presence? Pearls, diamonds, wine, olives, and oil. What do they have in common? Pressure. Anything of great value has gone through great pressure. Anything. Psalm 59, 16 through 17. This, is, this should be our response. Now, I understand that's a high calling, but this should be our response. As for me, in other words, we just sing it, right? You can have the whole world. You can take it all. Just give me Jesus. As for me, I will sing about your power. Each morning, I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in distress. That word distress can mean tribulation. It can also be translated as, as experiencing pressure. Oh, my strength, to you I sing praises. For you, O oh God, are my refuge, the God who shows me unfailing love. Tribulation, with the proper perspective, tribulation can be training. And testing always leads to testimony. Always, with the proper perspective. The word tribulation in scripture literally means pressure. The Greek word, I'll try it, flipsies, it's like a bunch of weird, yeah, philipses. But I'm gonna read this. This is right out of Greek lexicon. Listen to this. This is, this, is what, this is what pressure means, which is tribulation. What constricts or rubs together, used of a narrow place that hems someone in. Tribulation, especially internal pressure that causes someone to feel confined, restricted, and without options. Lord, give us the patient endurance described in James chapter five. The character building perseverance described in Romans five. May we truly be a people that feel so hemmed in. Listen, may we truly be a people that throw our hands up and say, I have no other option. I am without options because of the pressure I'm feeling. Like I've seen this example in regard to this. When you turn on a water hose and it's just the, the open end, right? Then the water at full blast is only gonna go so far. But when you put your thumb right over there, right? The water goes further, right? Pressure with the proper perspective does something that takes you further. Knowing that tribulation, the pressure can cause us to go further and to know him in a deeper way. Pastor Jason looked at this a couple weeks ago, but I wanna revisit it and, and Brad and Daniel, y'all can come up. We're gonna take communion in a moment. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 35 through 36. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You have need of endurance. I have need of endurance. We have need of endurance. But did you know that if we have the proper perspective on patience and pressure, then our endurance will inevitably be built because we realize that his presence has been sustaining us every step of the way every step of the way, amen? Every step of the way. We have incredible examples throughout scripture of those who were sustained through patience, pressure, and his presence. I mean, like literally, that could be an entire year-long series in and of itself, which should tell us something. That this book is filled with people just like you and me who faced the impossible, the insurmountable, 
the odds stacked against them, the desperate, the difficult, the tragic, where they had need of endurance, where they had to be patient, where they absolutely felt the pressure. But the common thread throughout scripture of those who overcome are those who held fast and realized that his presence, his presence is with us. His presence is with you. His presence is with you. Of all the incredible examples through scripture of those who were sustained through patience and pressure, we look unto Jesus, our prime example. I want you to consider this for a moment. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went throughout his physical life knowing that he made everything, that he could do anything, and yet chose to enter into humanity. And then if that doesn't show patience and pressure enough, he had to wait 30 years to fulfill his destiny. The patience that that would take, knowing. And then we see a tremendous amount of pressure through the passion of Christ. The pressure, the pressure, the crushing in Gethsemane the mocking and the beating in the courtyard, the scourging by the Roman officers, the crown of thorns on his precious head. It even says he could have called on legions of angels. The patience and the pressure How did he do it? Presence. The constant assurance from his Abba, from his Father. That's what's available to you today. That's what's available to you. (laughs) In Revelation chapter 5, It's interesting because John the Beloved, you know, he's he's in heaven's throne room. And it says this, he says that he wept, which is interesting because I thought there was no tears in heaven. It says John wept. Why did he weep? Because he says, there's no one who can open this scroll. Who can break this seal? Who can open this scroll? There's There's none found worthy. And then he's told, don't weep. Because there is one, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Seated. He can break the scroll. He can open the the scroll and break the seal. So I I want you to, the, the principle there is this. God will allow you to see and even feel the problem so that you can see him as the solution. John wept because he says, who can open this scroll? In your tribulation, in your situation, that needs to be your question, who, not what. What am I gonna do? That's what we oftentimes say. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Good, good. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Turn your what into a who. Who? Right? The Apostle Paul in Romans, who will deliver me from this body of death? 
Praise be to God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, before we take communion, I wanna give the opportunity for anybody in here, if you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, and prayer team, just hold on for a moment because we'll, we'll, we'll go to our position after communion. Bow your head across the room, and even online, if you're watching this right now, and you're just feeling a stirring in your heart, You wanna put your faith in Jesus. You wanna surrender your life to him. You're realizing his love for you, that forgiveness is real and available to you. His grace is for you. His mercy is new every morning. Or maybe you've wandered away and you need to rededicate yourself to him. It's, it's recognizing Jesus, you are Lord. If you've never done that before or you need to come back home, would you just raise your hand in this place? Anyone in here, I see you up to my left. Anyone else? I'm just gonna take another moment. And online, if this is for you, just open your heart right now. Confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Anyone else? Awesome, I see you up in the balcony. I see you to my right. Thank you, Jesus. So listen, this is what we're gonna do. If you raised your hand, I want you to open your heart right now. Receive the love of God. I'm just gonna say a simple prayer, and as I do, surrender your life to him. He's so worthy. Jesus, we love you and we believe. We believe that you lived a perfect, sinless life. We believe that you went to the cross. You were nailed to the cross, Jesus. You bled and you died on the cross. And with, with you was all of our sin, all of our shame. We believe you were buried. We believe you rose again. You ascended to heaven. You're seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You're making intercession for us right now. And you've given us your spirit. We believe these things, Jesus. I pray that you would strengthen those who are making this decision today. Encourage them, I pray. Encourage them, I pray. Listen carefully. We're about to take communion. I do not want anybody moving unless you absolutely have to. Um, but go ahead and open up that communion. And when it's open, would you stand? you get it open. I know sometimes they can be tricky, so no rush. <sighs> listen, as you, some are still opening, listen carefully to these instructions. Once we take this communion, please do not run out of here. Like, I want to stay, I want to say this right now. This is, this is very important. I feel like the Lord instructed me to do something after communion. So do not be dismissed, <laughs> okay? Do not be dismissed after we take communion. Did y'all hear me? Okay, I just wanna make sure. Do not be dismissed after we take communion. Okay, I promise I'll get you out of here on time. There is so much power in remembering what Christ endured. We sang that song earlier, I Plead the Blood. It's a, it's a remembrance of the body broken and the blood shed for you. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. So every time you eat of this bread, remember me. So let's remember the body of Christ broken for you. And then in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of a new covenant. Every time you take of this cup, remember me. So let's take this. Jesus, we thank you. 
Yeah, you can go ahead and set that down and begin to thank Jesus. Thank him for his sacrifice. Thank him for his blood that was shed. Remember, do not be dismissed. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. 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 Listen, when we say we plead the blood, we're not asking for something we don't already have. I want you to understand that. What we're doing is we're establishing a truth that was established many years ago when he cried out, it is finished. So listen, this is what we're gonna do. If you are in a situation, if you are in a trial, a tribulation, you're needing patient endurance, you're feeling the pressure, like it's serious. It seems like I have no idea how this could possibly end well. You felt anxiety, you felt fear. If you are in that type of situation right now, I want you to raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. Keep your hand up, please, this is important. Balcony as well. Now keep your hand up, now listen carefully. If you are within arm's reach of somebody with their hand up, I want you to put a hand on their shoulder. This is the body of Christ coming together. And we're gonna pray. You don't have to know all the details, God knows. Look around please and make sure nobody is standing there with their hand up without a hand on them. I want everybody to at least feel a hand on their shoulder, feel that support. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Go ahead and begin to pray. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna plead the blood of Jesus over that situation. Jesus, you shed your blood. You paid the ultimate price. So Lord, whatever we have need of, we know that we can make our prayers and petitions known unto you with thanksgiving. So Lord, I pray for these precious people who might be going through intense pressure of trials and tribulations. Lord, first I pray that they would have the standpoint of this. May the lamb receive the reward for his suffering. Jesus, may you be exalted. May you be lifted up. May you be glorified right in the middle of our affliction, God. May we look to you, Jesus. May we look to you. May we get our eyes off of the diagnosis. May we get our eyes off of the lack. May we get our eyes off of the pain. And may we look unto you. You are the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. And it was for the joy that was set before you, that enabled you to endure the cross. So Lord, may we put you ever before us. So we plead the blood over every situation, Lord. Over every situation, Lord. Over every situation, we trust you. I want everybody to sing this. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. It's more than enough. It's more than enough. It's more than enough. I plead the blood. Thank you, Lord. So, Jesus, I pray that you would bless your people, encourage them strengthen them with your might. May the joy of the Lord be their strength today, God. In the face of difficulty and opposition, the battle is not theirs. The battle belongs to the Lord. So we look to you, Jesus, and we trust you. Your blood speaks a better word, Lord, a better word. So we love you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. Prayer team, you can come forward. If you gave your life to Jesus, I wanna encourage you come to either of these corners up in the balcony as well. There will eventually be somebody there. If you need prayer, if you need further prayer, I wanna invite you to just come forward to some of the prayer team members that will be up here. But we love you. We're praying for you. We're here for you. We'll see you this Friday. Fall family night. We love y'all.
It's more